The next thing I want to do is explicitly go through step by step of how you actually solve problems using these kinematic equations for constant acceleration. Because this is a case where if you have a very clear idea in your mind of what are the steps you have to go through to solve these problems, they're very easy. If you try to kind of kludge together your own method of solving these problems, you'll get some of them right, but there's lots of little twists that will mess you up. Um, so this is the kind of subject that like when you're first getting started, it's really difficult. But once you kind of have an organized approach, you realize that these problems are actually extremely easy. Um, so try to think about this procedure and follow this procedure and don't get lost trying to kind of, you know, reinvent the wheel um, and uh, figure everything out, you know, from, from nothing every time you try to do one of these problems. So let me go through that procedure. Step one in the procedure. Now this, this sometimes might seem like a trivial step, uh, but sometimes it's actually an extremely important step. Um, the first one is identify the beginning and end of the time interval that you are considering. Um, so you wanna make sure you have a clear picture of what the initial state is and what the final state is. Many times I've seen students where they kind of, you know, gloss over this step because it's like, oh, I know what the beginning and end states are, like, give me a break. And then you give them a question on the test and they're like, but wait, isn't the final velocity here zero? And uh, you know, you're like, well, no, what do you think the final state is here? Because you know, sometimes the final state might not be the, the end of the entire problem. You might only be considering one little aspect of the problem to apply the kinematic equations to. Because the other thing to keep in mind here, the requirement for this time interval is that acceleration must be constant during the entire time interval or the equations won't work. So make sure, double check, that the acceleration is constant all the way up to and including both the initial state and the final state and everywhere in between. So like an example of where that comes into play is, where I often see this, is like a problem where, okay, ball is flying through the air at constant acceleration and I catch it in my hand. And then student will say, oh, well you caught it in your hand, that means the final velocity is zero. But wait a second, my hand is what brought the, the ball to zero. My hand exerted a force on the ball that changed its, its acceleration. So its acceleration while it was flying through the air is not the same as what its acceleration was while I was catching it. So the action of catching it is not included in the time interval where the acceleration is constant. So you have to double check that during the um, time interval of interest, the force on the object has to be constant and the acceleration has to be constant. So sometimes that's something that you don't even need to worry about, but there are some problems where that becomes very tricky, okay? Uh, step two, Make sure you know which direction is the positive direction. Um, and make sure you know also where is the origin of your coordinate system, basically. Um, so for instance, are you always going to say that right is positive and up is positive? You don't have to do that. I usually do that just because it, it seems like it makes it a little bit easier for people to follow what I'm doing. Um, but you know, some problems that might be very inconvenient to do. Some people like to pick the positive direction to be whatever's convenient for the problem they're working on rather than always choosing it to be the same. But you just have to make sure you know which way is positive so that you can you know, make all of your vector component choices consistent with that idea, okay? 
So these are just kind of the preliminary steps. Now, here's where the action really starts at step three. Here's where the action really starts. You wanna carefully read the question again and find the known kinematic variables out of the five I mentioned and list them. So generally, you will have three knowns for these kind of problems. Not always, but generally. Generally, you will have three out of the five kinematic variables known. So this is really key. Make sure that you list off what those three variables are. Make sure that you know they're actually known. Make sure about whether they're positive or negative. Make sure about their value. Um, and this will organize your whole thought process for how you're gonna approach that problem. And by the way, this also helps because if you find that you can't identify three knowns, then there's something weird is going on. Either you're missing something and maybe you're not reading the question carefully enough. Maybe there's like something that's known implicitly that you're not reading between the lines and seeing in the question, or there's some kind of twist in this problem where for some reason you don't know three of the variables. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, then the kind of second half of this step, you want to also identify um, which of the kinematic variables out of the five standard variables is the unknown that you want to solve for. So when I say the unknown here, there's generally two variables that are unknown in these problems, but one of them is usually something that's unknown and you want to solve for. The other one might be something that's unknown, but who cares? It's not going to do you any good to solve for it. So you want to identify which of the unknowns is actually the one you're trying to solve for. Okay, so now you've identified three knowns and one unknown. Now it's obvious how to do it. Now you look at your list of kinematic variables, look at the list of, of equations, and choose the one with the four variables you've identified in steps three to four. So you basically now have a list in front of you on your paper which says these three are known, this is the one I wanna solve for, that gives you a total of four. I mentioned in the previous video, each of the kinematic equations has four variables in it. So you'll choose whichever equation has those four variables in it, and then you just simply solve it. So that's just doing algebra. So um, biggest mistake people make in this section of the course is, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll talk to students who are struggling with this topic and say like, okay, let me see you solve one of these problems. And what they'll do is they'll read the question and then they jump right to step five of look at the list of equations and try to pick one. And then they'll say to me, I don't know which equation to pick. How are you supposed to know? Well, it's because you skipped every step in the problem. You know, you can't just jump to the end of the problem and think that you're, you're just magically gonna know how to do it. You're just magically gonna know what the answer is. You've gotta go through the steps of organizing your thoughts and figuring out what you're doing. By the time you look at the list of kinematic equations, you should already know what you're looking for. I mean, this is the equivalent of like, um, sometimes I use the analogy of like, let's say that you're, you're doing like a carpentry project, you're building a bookcase. You know, how, how do you determine what tools you're gonna use in building the bookcase? First, you figure out, okay, what am I doing? What, what, what's the step that I'm currently working on? What am I trying to do? And then you say, okay, what tool do I need to do this job? And then you say, okay, I'm gonna go grab that tool from the toolbox and you go find that tool and then use it. You don't start a project by saying, okay, step one, I'm gonna get out my toolbox, open it up and select a tool. That doesn't make any sense. How can you select a tool if you don't know what problem you're even solving yet? So if you're finding that you don't know which equation to pick in the kinematic equations, it means you're trying to jump ahead to the end of the problem 
and you need to slow down and do this step by step. Um, so if in doubt on these kinematic equation problems, um, go through these steps and uh, you should have a much easier time, uh, much easier time solving it. Oh, one other thing I want to throw in here that I didn't mention, um, when you're identifying the beginning and the end of the time interval and things like that, let me also throw in, it's usually a good idea, especially as the problems get more complicated, to draw the initial and final states so that you can actually see it on the paper. It really helps you organize your thoughts a lot and it really helps you see like where all your variables are, which way they're pointing, should they be positive or negative, which ones are on the initial state, which ones are on the final state and all that type of stuff. So solving these problems is all about organizing your thoughts in a way where you can take something which seems very complex and organize it in a way where you can see the path ahead. Um, so try to approach it with that viewpoint.